Welcome to the AI First Business Podcast with Tina Yazdi, where we show you how teams, companies, and leaders are turning AI hype into ROI. Welcome, Karthik. Hi, Tina. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, so just a quick intro on Karthik. In the field of artificial intelligence, uh, Karthik is a visionary leader. He has extensive experience solving complex AI challenges. Um, he's currently the co-founder and CEO of Armilla AI, uh, which we're going to talk about a bit today. And um, he honed, I think, like 15 years or was it 20 years of experience um, at Element AI? Oh, uh, Element was about four years, but of course, 15 years in the tech industry. 15 years in the tech industry. Um, and uh, before focusing specifically on AI, um, he had leadership role at companies like Deloitte and Gallup Labs. Um, so he's quite a key figure in shaping, shaping not only AI-driven innovation, but responsible AI-driven innovation. Armilla AI is leading the way in how do you ensure AI technology. And just to give you a little bit of a preview of like the kind of situations where this is really important. And this will happen in the last month. We are recording this end of March. So this is between February and March. Uh, there was a fiasco with Air Canada where their AI chatbot misled consumers about certain policies. A court ruled that that's too bad for them and they still are responsible to own up to it. AI fakes are currently being evaluated in court systems around the world to for them to find a way forward on how to like, manage that problem. Media and content companies have sued OpenAI, Microsoft, Anthropic, Midjourney, etc. around use of their content. Seeking Alpha reported that the New York Times uh, denied it improperly used open AI products. There's a lawsuit around that. And then I don't need to name the lawsuits around open AI. There's many. One quote that I saw two days ago is that more than 100 top AI researchers have signed an open letter on gen AI companies to allow investigators access to their systems, arguing that opaque company rules are preventing them from safety testing tools that are being used by millions of people. Over to you, Karthik. Do you want to talk a little bit about this space and how Armila AI kind of enters the conversation? Great. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there is a lot that has happened in this, this more that we haven't even uh, covered in, in those three topics. AI adoption has always been a bit of a red herring for enterprises. Artificial intelligence, as for all the benefits it provides, there's two fundamental issues with it. One is the black box nature of these models, right? And how do we actually understand how they make a decision? Uh, they're a bit opaque just by the very nature. And then the second is they're probabilistic systems, right? So they're not going to uh, give you a definitive answer every single time. There's always a, a margin of error or, or an uncertainty in each output. So that means inherently these models will contain some level of error. Now, the, the size of that error means whether it's doing well or not will result in whether it's doing well or not. So now we come to these three things that we talked about, right? Air Canada's issue, or there's a slew of companies that have been brought in front of the courts. State Farm, for instance, we've had Cigna and United Health, where there's a lawsuit around the use of AI and how it's been perhaps not dealing with claims appropriately. So in all of these situations, organizations have been struggling with how do we ensure that we understand when a model does well, and more importantly, when it's going to fail. And what the impact of that failure or high level of uncertainty that output, how big is that failure to their own business and the impact of that on their business? Now, in Air Canada's situation, I mean, the lawsuit ended up with a $900 fine uh, in Canadian dollars. Should Air Canada have contested that? Perhaps not. It was a very weird argument that they made that the model was a, a separate legal entity, right? But the court said, it doesn't matter. You deployed it, you used it, and it gave the output. And so therefore you were responsible and accountable for it at the end of the day. And this is what most regulations are coming out to say, that the organizations need to take accountability for, for, for the outputs of their models. And so this puts a big onus on the enterprises and it's slowing down AI adoption to a certain degree. Uh, but that's where Armada AI comes in. How do we create trust in these models, both in the work we do in terms of certifications and audits and, and uh, assessments of these models? And then finally, when you do all of that and things still can go wrong, uh, Murphy does exist, or Murphy's <laughs> law still exists, then insurance can step in as a way to provide that underlying protection. So on that note, can you um, share a little bit more about what is Armilla AI, what are you doing, and why does it matter so much in terms of not only 
opening the way for AI being used to its full potential in these organizations, but also on the tail end of that, the steps needed to be taken to that it's trustworthy and responsible. Armella is essentially, we're starting to underwrite the risks of AI models. And what that really means is we get a comprehensive view on, as I said, where a model does well, and more importantly, where it can go off the rails. And what's the probability of that error? Based on that, we can then provide insurance on top of the systems to say, if, you've, if an organization has taken all the right steps in the training, development, and deployment of these AI systems, then there's a level of insurability that should anything go wrong, we will cover them for the damages that can happen. Now, insurance has stepped in as a way of that protection across history and most recently in the stick cyber and as, as an example, right? Where as we move to the cloud, cyber risks have grown multiple times in, in the size of its risk. And today it's a $15 billion business. And what that means is we can protect organizations should there be cyber attacks or privacy issues, et cetera, once they've taken all the right steps. We need a corollary for that in the AI. And that's what Armila is doing and, and bringing to the table. That in that process, we obviously assess the models for their, um, for their accountability, the robustness, the performance, which then allows us to create trust for the enterprises who are adopting them as well. So that's in a nutshell what we do, but ultimately we're here to understand the risks of AI and then insure against them. And then on that note, obviously it provides that assurance for the companies themselves, but do you see also our Mila AI stamp of approval being a reassurance for people using these products as well? Like they see it and they're like, okay, like there was a little bit of checking done before they decide to like use it. Yeah, side. absolutely. Um, because as I mentioned, as a part of that understanding the insurability of the model, we mm. underwrite those risks. So it is in our best interest, in our Miller's best interest to understand yeah. those risks really well, which ultimately we can then offer to both the enterprises adopting these systems, the third party vendors who are building these systems and the consumers who are benefiting from the results of these systems to ensure that they can adopt these and, and use these safely. Right. And so, yeah. Absolutely. The underwriting process automatically provides that level of comfort and confidence that mm -hmm. these systems are working. Kind of get, can we get a little bit into the technicalities of this process? What are some things that people listening or even companies listening might not appreciate about the particularities of ensuring this type of technology? And as a part two to that, are there any surprising areas that people wouldn't expect are particularly complicated? Um, but your finding actually is? Yeah, that's a great question. The challenge with assessing a model, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to say it's a model, but these models are so diverse. You know, you have regression, right. you have classification models, you have language models, you have vision models, and then now we have generative AI models, which are multimodal, right? And so it's easy to say, let's measure, let's assess, and let's audit these systems. But what it takes is, is quite complicated depending on the type of model. The second piece, to assessing these models is knowing what the ground truth is. Oh, what, philosophical. Right? Well, it, philosophical, but actually a practical issue, right? Like when we say this is right, mm -hmm. right against what, right? So do we know right. what right looks like to be able to say this system is right in its output? Can Sorry. I ask for like maybe a tangible example for someone listening? Because th this can yeah. get quite, you can go anywhere with that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a good point. So Maybe, uh, maybe Air Canada. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, great. That's um, an example. You know, that might be actually an easy example to illustrate. It is right? an easy so, one. That's why, yeah. So what happened in there, maybe it, it's worthwhile to just walk through what happened with the Air Canada case, right? They used a chatbot, which was, and I'm not exactly sure whether it was an LLM or like a generative AI model or a mm -hmm. NLP question answer system, right? That, that you can create as well, which is a little bit more simpler than a generative AI model. Basically, they have this chatbot where a consumer or a, a, or a passenger could come in, type in a question, and would get a result. The model was, was trained on all of their policy documents, right, and procedures. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, the passenger came in and said, hey, you have a bereavement policy whereby if I have to travel for an emergency purpose because of, you know, a death in the family or something of that nature, I believe I can get a refund or something of that nature. Tell me what the process is. And the mom responded back and say, well, go ahead, book your ticket, and then post, you can go apply for the refund. However... The policy document actually said, you have to apply for the discount before you apply, um, um, purchase a ticket itself, mm. right? So now the model made an error. It read the uh, policy form incompletely. So 
And Canada's contention was, well, you know, the model made a mistake. It's the model's fault. The model's not owned by us or it's a legal entity, as they argued. And so therefore, we're not accountable for, for that result. And we don't owe the passenger the money. Now, the court ruled uh, otherwise. Of course, so what could it, of course <laughs> disagree, right? So what exactly happened in that situation? And what could Air Canada have done to prevent that? So first of all, the ground truth here is that policy document. It's an internal document. It's pretty clear. Oh. It's a Word document on someone's right. computer. Yeah. Actually, it's available on the web. So if, if, if it's asking the chatbot, if I had gone on, yeah, right. So I can go read up Air Canada's policy and read me and I would have gotten the result. The whole point of a chatbot is to make that easy. I don't have to go through this you know, I don't know, 100-page policies that they have, and it cuts to the chase. Now, first of all, one should have, when you're building such a system, tested all the various types of questions it can ask. Now, in the generative AI case, it's prompting, right? So question X, what's the answer? The answer that the LLM or the generative or the model that it provides, we need to be able to reference check that against something, and that's the ground truth. Right. So, I, never, yeah. can I ask a deep question Please. on this process, which I imagine Armilla AI has some kind of version of? What does done look like with the testing? Because do, do you test every possible combination of everything for something like this that is feasible, complicated but feasible? Um, but it isn't for everything, right? So, what are some like practical things that you follow when consulting with new clients? Of like how deep you have to go, how long? What are the best practices around this? That's a great question. So. You know, in this particular case, either you would have done a hundred thousand different questions, looked at the results and compared it, and you have to do that in an automated fashion. That's where the complexity lies. Now, to your point about it's never going to be a hundred percent accurate as well, or complete in terms of testing. Users uh, and human users are very ingenious in the way they ask a question, the way they frame a question. So you have, these are called edge cases, right? So the edge cases right. are what has not been considered. So what you try to do in this testing is to be as comprehensive as possible. You're not going to get it 100% right, but you've eliminated as many of these outliers as possible, then you're closer to being um, um, stating that the model does, does function as, as, as required, right? Now, there's absolutely going to be cases where it will get it wrong. And you need to have contingency measures. What happens when, you deal, when that situation happens? Right. In this case, should Air Canada have gone to the courts to contest or should they have just settled it and said, sorry, our bad, our model gave you a wrong output, it's $800 or $900, we'll, we'll cover it up instead of becoming an international sensation, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. It's a choice. So you need to have now governance and policies around how do you deal with these situations when they occur? I don't know if this relates to the work that you're doing, but would you say there's an item three, which is repairing trust? Absolutely. Which it's a bit of a branding protection thing, but I you're absolutely right. Brand can't reputation. imagine you can ignore that. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. You know. I'm, this is maybe a bit off topic, but I don't think it's just brand reputation, but it's also these media examples are building a mental model of trust in AI generally. I think that's also something that worries me. I think you, you, I think you're hitting the um, the crux of the point is the, that one single brand, but to your point, the brand of AI itself is being impacted as a result, right? You're you're a hundred percent right. And in fact, I had a conversation with uh, with another reporter about this as well. But go, going back to your to your point, yes, the the policies that we create, we have to think about the principles, and that's what responsible AI is about, right? Mm -hmm. What are we responsible for? What are our principles, our tenets? So what do we want to live by? And is that reflective? And, and, and that sounds like a very esoteric philosophical question, and it is. But you need to translate that into something tangible that developers of the systems, the data scientists, the various different teams, the risk and compliance teams, the legal teams, uh, the product managers, they all understand and are complying with. Right, when they design right. these systems. And that's where it gets challenging. So one of the previous questions you asked, like, you know, what's the surprising thing that you find that companies are struggling with? This is it, right? It's the data scientists, great quants. They can go in and, and build the systems as we want them. But it's these mm -hmm. intangibles that we need to deal with that becomes very difficult, right? How do you take a philosophical, our principles, our brand, you know, what do we, what does the brand stand for? And then translating that into practices that's yeah. hard. Now, coming back to the media question, you know, one thing I would say is as much as there are bad stories and we all like to sensationalize things, we all mm -hmm. go after the 
hey, this thing did something wrong. There are so many positives that are happening with AI. And I think we need to balance out, right? Why should we care about AI and versus fear AI? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and this is not just uh, one thing. It's not just about them getting it wrong or them being biased. It's also we're going to lose jobs. And then there's existential risk. All these topics that are being covered. But I think we need to have a balanced view. Every reporter yeah. that's talking about these things, while they talk about the risks of AI, they should also talk about the benefits it has delivered. 100%. We talked about Air Canada, which is quite a self contained example. Um, but I have to ask how are you approaching the majority of cases where the data ingested by the AI isn't coming from the company itself necessarily. And I mean, I feel like that's infinite black hole to try to like, how, like, do you then only accept companies whose data sources you've also insured? Like how, how are you navigating the data sources that are like out in the wilds? How do you ensure that? That's hard. I don't think I'll say we can ensure that really well or even insurance. I mean, can we even as an organization try to put our arms around what the model's been trained on? And the answer is no, right? Right now, no. Because if a model has been trained on all of the internet, right, as some of these <laughs> large language models are, you know, you're going to have seepage of perhaps copyrighted information or just maybe harmful information that, that's been uploaded. I mean, how to build a bomb, right? Like, something of that nature, right? And then you can now start getting out of these models very pointedly. What we're seeing is good implementations of something called RAG or Retrieval Augmented Systems. So what they do is you take a foundation model and you contain it for the use case that you're using it for, right? So okay. let's say you used the Llama model or even the OpenAI model. It's trained on all of the internet, but you, want, you need to make it specific to your organization. So you then train it mm -hmm. with your specific documents and content and then you put guardrails around it to make sure that any outputs that deviate from what you wanted to say, it gets caught mm -hmm. and filtered out, right? So that's one way in which we can protect ourselves where it's just not a general system. It is a general purpose system that's been adapted to your specific use case. Right. Just to kind of like one more angle at this, what examples, if any, can you share of what good looks like, like the, the ones that the most ethical, but, trying their hardest, following reasonable principles and have the talent and engineering capacity to like actually adhere to that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I can't speak uh, categorically about this only from mm -hmm. what, we, uh, what we've experienced or what we've read about, right? I would say for the majority, most organizations have are taking the right steps. Are mm -hmm. they perfect? The answer is no. And that's where the yeah. challenge comes in, right? Like OpenAI has a very large trust and safety team. On the other hand, you have Google with their Gemini model, which also got in trouble. Again, a very good safety team, but they over-engineered on the safety, whereby it became, I mean, too restrictive in what it said mm -hmm. and frankly put up non-factual output. I don't know if right. you're familiar with that case, but, you know, two weeks ago. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't call out any one single company to say they are perfect mm -hmm. or they're doing it perfectly. I think most organizations that we have encountered are trying to do the right things. Right. Here's the thing. There is, now we're getting philosophical. What's the objective truth on things, right? I mean, that's why we have varying opinions, right? Someone may consider that's some... That's what the court decides. Uh, <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whoever well, wins the case, no? Well, not everything can be decided. Yeah, I don't really law. think that, just to clarify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, practically, yes. I mean, there, there will be some yeah. opinion that's delivered, right? And the ju well, that's why you have juries, right? You have 12 people's mm -hmm. opinions, and then we see, okay, what's the majority opinion here? And, and that's what you get a decision on. But liberals versus conservatives, right? Like you have this they consider different things to be right and true and they're very mm -hmm. opposed to each other, right? So when you're a company sitting in the middle and you have constituents mm -hmm. and stakeholders on both sides, mm -hmm. you're going to make someone unhappy at some point, right? Because of what choices you've made. So it, it is a difficult line that these companies are trying to navigate and take a path on. But all I'll say is they're trying. Can they do better? Of course, all of us can do better and I think they can do better too. But what we also have to remember is that this technology is nascent. It's mm -hmm. still in, it's what, I think the first one year anniversary of GPT-4 was yesterday or last week, right? right which means yeah. this is a massive, massively capable system, which is very, very complex that has taken widespread adoption in the last one year. So I expect that we're going to go through these turbulent times until we yeah. settle on what good looks like and how do we get there. 
Speaking of turbulent times, we didn't talk about this yet. It just kind of occurred to me as I was listening to you. Do you think there's a type of race between getting to ethical frameworks and governance between top-down movements like the EU AI Act versus bottom-up efforts led by companies themselves in hand with companies like Armilla AI. I don't know if that's come up for you, but I'm curious what your thoughts on where where that kind of sits right now. Because obviously I live in Amsterdam and in the EU, the Act has passed and that's going to kind of shape things. But in places where that hasn't happened, you guys, companies like yours are actually leading the way in a way. So what do you think? It's a push from the pull. Most organizations also are not happy with the regulations, right? The government stepping mm-hmm. in into what should be done because, again, you're not going to get it right, right? You're not going to get it right for everybody. And so they can become overly punitive or restrictive uh, as regulations mm-hmm. go. But at the same time, organizations also need a little bit of a push. They say, hey, you need to do this now and you need to take this seriously, right? So that's why mm-hmm. regulations step in. So yeah. it's, a bit of, it's a push and a pull between, between the two. At the end of the day, we see organizations who take responsible efforts proactively. If I were to name one, I would take Salesforce as an example. Kathy Baxter, who heads up the Responsible AI efforts at Salesforce, trying to do a great job, right, of trying to make sure the entire organization that they have a framework and a policy. And so organizations that are not waiting on regulations and taking that accountability onto themselves exist. There are companies who are taking a wait and see approach to see what regulations mm-hmm. will actually say. Because here's the other thing. Let's say I implement something today as an, as an enterprise and regulation comes up 90 degrees orthogonal to what we you implemented. Now you have to go and reverse all of that work that you've done, right? So yes. why spend the effort if regulations are coming as well? There's a wait and see approach mm-hmm. too. And I think in the work that we do, most of the things that we tell clients is, look, standards exist, right? So you have the NIST standard, you have the... ISO 42001, which was confirmed at the end of December. In fact, I just spoke with Martha, who was one of the people leading that effort at at ISO organization. You can start with that today. Mm -hmm. And most of these regulations will follow or endorse a bunch of these frameworks. So you can't go wrong by starting there. So that's for the wait and see folks. And then, of course, there are people who, there's other companies who are on the vanguard of this. When you talk about, you know, organizations taking accountability, ultimately organizations are made of people. Let's say like maybe someone's listening to this and they're worried about like, is my organization taking the right steps? Or there's someone who's like struggling on how to navigate that. Who are the people in an organization that typically are specifically accountable? Like, is this like the CTO's office? Is it more of the CIO's mandate? Is it the legal team? Or who's best situated? Let's say it like that. So we've seen multiple variations of these, right, in terms of who takes the lead in organizations. So you've, you've got, you know, all the way from, you know, companies that have chief AI officer, uh, under mm-hmm. whom the use cases, I mean, there's the stewards of AI within the organization. And so when it resides with them, and if they're given enough, if they're empowered enough to have the team to make their efforts effective, I've, you've seen that very successful. Right, because mm-hmm. they can tie in the multiple stakeholders. You've got risk and compliance. You've got your legal teams, as you said, the data science teams. And if you're a large organization, you don't have one data science team. You have, right. if you have a distributed organization, you can have data science teams in multiple silos of the organization. So how do you, you know, bring them all together? I think that's one thing. One thing I do find missing, though, often enough, is board level involvement in this. Okay. Ultimately, what, what was successful in the cyberspace was when mm-hmm. the board had a chief security officer or chief information officer with a board level accountability for their cyber issues. Mm-hmm. We need to see that same thing happen in AI. And I think when that happens, you'll have more rapid adoption and more onus and focus put on you know uh, all of these things that we just talked about. So. It can be any one of these teams that we've seen risk and compliance take the lead, but most often it's from the product teams. It's, uh, it's the chief AI officer or the data science officer, but you know, with support from the board, I think they'll be very effective. Are you seeing that the CISO office isn't necessarily the lead on these projects? Like, are, is there a distinction in how people talk about like the AI technology piece and its security and like the rest of the stuff that is already secured? Let's hope. Yeah, and that's a great point. It's, it's not chunked together as one big thing. 
You're absolutely right. So I, we've also seen the CTO. Uh, we've also seen the CISO mm-hmm. take the accountability of these things. As I said, it mm-hmm. depends. Where, it varies from organization to organization. But naturally, the, the chief information security officer who are responsible for IT systems and AI as a technology will fall under IT systems. And they have the practices and procedures in place for security, privacy, mm-hmm. putting that into action. So yes, they're absolutely natural homes for, for this mm-hmm. accountability to exist as well. We've also seen chief AI officers report into the C- CTO, right? The CTO and the CISOs sometimes work, you know, side by side or one rep- uh, you know, the CISO might report to the CTO. So again, it's hard for me to give a definitive answer because organizational structures right. are so different acro- across them. But you've called out all the stakeholders, the AI, leading the AI efforts, the technology officers, the chief information officers, the risk and the CRO, the chief risk officer, and the chief legal officer. The and sometimes even the CFO, because the legal and risk team some, uh, report into the chief financial officer, right, oftentimes. Mm-hmm. So uh, we've seen a mix of this come in. But ultimately, as long as we are able to give accountability and empower these, or, uh, these folks to be able to do what they need to do, that's when it becomes successful. What are the trends you're seeing among... I'll say that in the EU, let's take the EU as an example. Now that the EU AI Act has passed and will likely become legislation this summer... We find European Union organizations, in the next 18 months, you will see a lot more adoption, policies, uh, responsible AI and governance uh, being put in place, risk management of AI becoming truly something that they put an effort towards. But remember, the, the EU has severe penalties as well, 6 to 7% of global revenues. I mean, for someone like Google, yeah. that's $50 billion or maybe even more. So it's a significant chunk, right? So mm-hmm. I think... Globally, the same is going to happen, that if you're a global organization, even operating, even if you're not headquartered, but operating in the EU, you have to adopt and conform with the regulation, which means in the next 18 months, we're going to see a significant uptick in organizations needing to put in their governance Mm -hmm. controls and risk management around AI. Now, a lot of folks will call it responsible AI. You know, there's many terms that are being used, and I think that's one way that we do disservice. But I feel like we're coalescing now in a few certain terms. Governance seems to be the, mm-hmm. the, the big convergent term. But under that, you know, you have responsible AI practices, transparency, the ethics of AI, um, uh, the robustness and performance. So uh, being mm-hmm. in, in ensuring that these models work well. So I think that's going to be the biggest thing that we're going to see in the next 18 months. The second big thing I would say is adoption of AI might slow down because they need to put their arms around what governance looks like. So if that's the first step that needs to happen or in parallel is going to happen, you might not see generative AI being adopted as quickly as we think right. they're going to be, right? So that's the, the downside, in fact, of that as well. But maybe it's the right thing to do, but that's a natural order of things, right? So we're already seeing that a little bit in the, in the organizations where there's certainly a bit of a measured approach mm-hmm. before very large enterprises start adopting generative AI. On the flip side, we're seeing a ton of startups come through where they're focused on ensuring that they can take existing workflows, existing processes, existing applications, and essentially, quote unquote, AI find them and making them more efficient. So I think there will be a meeting of, of that at some point. And the final thing I would say is just more general. I think we're going to see some new chips coming through, uh, new compute right. paradigms, because so far NVIDIA has done a fantastic job of getting us here. But when you, you know, as Jeff Bezos says, uh, your margin is my opportunity. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> we're, we're already seeing a lot of uh, chip startups. Uh, many of them are under stealth, by the way. And so they will be creating inference-based chips, for example, Grok, uh, which is doing really well. We're going to see more chip companies coming in to tackle and create more competition for NVIDIA. Do you have maybe some points of advice for maybe like leader of a team or someone listening who's early in their process in kind of establishing the groundwork for ensuring that AI can be used you know, responsibly and legally and without too much risk in their company, like they're just getting started. What would your advice be on maybe some key points for them to think about and like what action um, they should take and who they should already maybe involve early in the conversation, whether that's like an insurance company or maybe other stakeholders as well? Yeah. I mean, I think the first, we understand how to train models well now, learn how to make sure that they, they deliver on results. 
uh, better now. I think testing and putting guardrails mm-hmm. on these systems is, I don't think enough is being done. So mm-hmm. the first and foremost, it's to say, we need to get better at testing these mm-hmm. systems. I mean, back in the day, you know, we wouldn't put software out there without testing the heck out of them, stress test uh, software yeah. systems. What's the corollary for that in, in AI? It, it doesn't really exist except for some level of validation. I mean, again, don't get me wrong. Data, science absolute, data scientists absolutely validate their systems, but is it enough? Right? And I think more mm-hmm. focus needs to be put in that because the, that's the first step to yeah. ensuring your systems are safe. Right? So then you can go into, okay, what does testing look like? And you can start defining for that use case and you can then start adopting AI principles and frameworks and standards that all come into play. But that's the first question. Have we stress test these systems in a way that we are confident that when we put them out there in production, we're not going to run into, you know, someone <laughs> as an executive that I was initially speaking to called it a boo-boo, right? A uh, very technical <laughs> term, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, very technical very technical. So uh, we just need to avoid more boo-boos, uh, but uh, I think it's it within our hands to do so. Amazing. And are there any points maybe that we missed or thoughts that you want to share before we close off for today? The one thing I would like to go back to something that you brought up very much, uh, you know, the start of our conversation, which is we talk a lot and focus a lot on the downside risks of AI. And I think what organizations need to understand, I think they do, but really understand the benefits of what AI will bring to them. I think they do understand it, but I just want to caution that let's not let the risks of AI prevent us from realizing those benefits. And so there are things that we can do. It can be an engineering problem. So engineering is solvable. Mm -hmm. We can engineer our way off it. That's my belief. And we just need to get it done. Oh, Karthik, you don't know how much I agree with this point. And I think... History always has lessons around these things. If if you were to frame, again, there's maybe an argument that you shouldn't frame it like this, but if you were to frame it on the long history of things versus automation, you can go back to the printing press, the tractor, the shipping container. And if you look at the news from that era, they are pretty much the exact same types of fears that we see being reported on today which has an element of being comical, but is also maybe a warning that, first of all, the risks that we think will be the problem, we have no idea what the actual problem is going to be. There will be one, but we just have no visibility on on it anyways. And also the opportunities that these things that we were so scared of ended up creating in terms of jobs, productivity, safety, eventually kind of won over the narrative and we don't even think about them anymore. But this is my personal stance on AI, which is that exactly what you said, it's not to ignore or like dismiss the valid concerns and things that are going wrong. Those need to be known to be addressed, but that's not like the punchline of the story, I don't think. No, and I couldn't agree. Again, we're agreeing with each other quite a bit here on this so point. So much agreement. Uh, I was, and just anecdotally, I was in the Computer History Museum in Mountain View a couple of weeks ago. And I took my son there. How old is your son? Uh, he's 10. W- one of the news clippings from, uh, that was on display was how the the automated machines are going to take jobs away, right? From, I mean, before we mm-hmm. had calculators, you had, and they had a picture of this room full of people who were making tabulations, right? Like through log tables and then showed the evolution of computing, even through analog systems and then digital, but as digital mm-hmm. was coming in, like it's going to take all these jobs away. We could not have been more productive. I mean, we are more productive today than we were before. More jobs are being created by technology than they were before. In fact, you know, one of the tropes around AI right now is, oh, all the creative jobs are going to go away with these generative AI models being able to create art and movies and write scripts and and all of that. Actually, the same thing was said when um, Adobe Photoshop came in. But I think human ingenuity and our uh, ability to create is what makes us Mm -hmm. human. And I think as long as we have that, I... I don't think we're going to be at a place where jobs are gone. We're just going to have new jobs. They're going to look different. Thank you so much for joining today. I can't wait to share this content and I'm sure it'll provide some really good pointers to a lot of people and some points of consideration as well about how to get this right to the best of our current ability. Thank you, Tina. 
Let us know if you enjoyed this episode with a five-star rating or like. You can also find snack-sized content on our Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn pages. Our newsletter and episode hubs live on our Substack.